This is Rich Baker, and uh, we're going to continue trying to distill the information shared by somebody in Hebrews 1. And because uh, we really don't know who, who wrote Hebrews, uh, but it's okay because the information that's in it is uh, accepted by historical church in um, antiquity. Uh, way back, like uh, at least prior to 90 AD, uh, and the information in it is uh, valuable and certainly viable. So that's that's why it's part of the uh, part of the canon. Certainly, I'll give you a heads up that Hebrews will mention time-related words such as after or became or today concerning the status of Yeshua or Jesus. But keep in mind that Jesus' deity is in eternity, but his status as redeemer was added to his status of creator in the fourth dimension, which is time as we know. You know, time was created for our sake so that we understand a little more of God's structure. And we'll see in just a minute about that loaded word structure uh, when we get into the actual scripture. But keep in mind that Jesus' status was added to, but that he was never an angel. Uh, and one of the problems is that evidently in Jewish tradition, the expected Messiah would come from the angelic um, realm. And so Michael, for instance, was probably expected to become the Messiah. And I had not seen this before, but uh, sure enough, in uh, Deuteronomy 33.2 and in uh, Psalm 68.17, it alludes to the angels being present at uh, Sinai, at Mount Sinai. Uh, so uh, that's why the Jewish tradi tradition would expect the angels to be um, more involved in uh, the messianic uh, line. So we'll start out verse 1. Hebrews 1 verse 1. In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. So here's that, that, that time thing again. In the past uh, the prophets spoke and so it implies that there is a change coming so in the past this happened but so you hear the but coming and sure enough in verse 2 it says but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe so he has spoken to us by his son so things have now changed from speaking from prophets to now speaking through his son, or right, who's his son. And we gotta remember too, that the son didn't fail in speaking God's words because he is the word. So the prophets spoke of what was to come, but then what came, the Messiah, uh, didn't fail to um, bring the full word of God. It's very interesting in the different uh, versions of the Bible that translated this. Now keep in mind I do not know uh, Greek or Hebrew so I trust in those that do. Um, and so you look up and I'm going to tell you about uh, 12 or 13 different versions that what they translated um, from the original words. So the NIV says the universe, New Living Translation, the universe, English Standard, the world, Berean Study Bible, the universe, the King James Version, the world's plural with an S, New American Standard, the world, 
Christian standard, the universe, American standard, the world's, good news, which is interesting sometimes, the universe, the NET Bible, the world, Hebrew Bible, the ages, literal standard, the ages, Young's literal, the ages, Weymouth New Testament, the ages, Berean literal, the ages. Interesting, really interesting. So what can we decipher from the ages? David Gusick says the ancient Greek word here translated worlds or ages is A-I-O-N, aeon, from which we get our English word eons. Interesting. It means that Jesus made more than the material world. He also made the very ages. History itself is the creation of the Son of God. Think about that. That is, it's like having nothing and putting out a structure of time, the ages, in order to build creation upon. Um, and that's just amazing to me. So fizz.org defines uh, what's called the super string theory that defines 10 dimensions each one with seemingly near infinite power over the lower dimensions. Chuck Missler said that uh, there's a rabbinical tradition that says God exists in the 11th dimension. So according to verse two, God created through Jesus, therefore he is the creator. Jesus is the creator. So let's compare that concept to some other scripture. John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Pretty specific. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation for in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things and in him all things hold together and then of course finally uh, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 yet for us there is but one God the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live so Jesus is pretty much everything verse 3 the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word so according to uh, Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1-3, God spoke his word to create all things. So guess who was the word? And we've discussed this. It was Jesus. So how do we know the word was Jesus? Well, according to John 1-14, Jesus was the word of the creator from the beginning. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the radiance equals the brightness of God's glory. So consider Isaiah 48, 11, B, where God says, My glory I will not give to another. Well, that's interesting. If Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, and God won't give his radiance to anyone else, then Jesus must be God. It continues to go on. Sustaining all things. Well, here's where it gets a little deep. 
we're going to get into atomic physics and Kalum's law which states that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So we discussed this uh, earlier sometime in Revelation 21 where atoms are real anomalies. A like force opposes another like force and unlike forces attract each other. Protons that are in the nucleus of an atom should repel each other, yet they are held together. When that glue is removed, everything explodes. Now, quoting from uh, Morningside.edu, they had a pretty good definition of this situation. It says, of course, since the electric force is constantly trying to drive the protons apart, the force that holds them all in must be stronger than that electric force. And keeping in mind, the electric force gets stronger as charged particles get closer together. And the protons in the nu nucleus are very close together. As a result, the force that holds protons and neutrons together must be very strong. Well, in a brilliant stroke of imagination, physicists have named this force the strong force. Some also call the strong force the atomic glue. It would be hard not to requote Colossians 1, 17, where it says that he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Wow, this is getting physical properties put to uh, what we thought was a spiritual statement. So what would happen if the strong force were to release? Now this seems to be prophesied in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? that's pretty much what's going to happen when the strong force as they say is taken away we'll go on in scripture here in what we call 3b verse 3b after he had provided purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and so how much room is there to sit at the right hand of anyone let alone god there's only one place for someone to sit at the right. And so it is with God. It is Jesus who will sit, who has sat at his right hand. He and he alone is at, at God's right hand. There is only one way to God, and that is through the one who is at his right hand. Verse 4, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So, Jesus became one of us. And so he was, for a time, a little lower than the angels. Why do I say that? Psalm 8, 4, and 5. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. So he was a little while lower than the angels, but not really. He still had uh, his being as, as God, but he had to become a part of us, become human, a little lower than the angels for a time because he was chosen before the foundation of the world, according to 1 Peter 1.20. Gino Garassi says he had an inherent superiority, but obtained an acquired superiority 
by his incarnation and his experience of death. So the second person of the Trinity doesn't get created. He always existed. Look at John 1, 1 again. But as um, Mr. Garasi says, he does acquire a second nature. As the creator, he was qualified to redeem his creation. As the redeemer in action for 33 years, he fulfilled the act of redemption with his blood and so he became or he acquired a second nature described for us in a time domain format of God's firstborn only begotten son the chosen one who gets everything even worship remember that only begotten indicates um, the favored only uh, special uh, individual Son of God. In Hebrews 1 and 2, there's a big deal made about Jesus being far superior to angels. Angels are at the top of the food chain of creation. And yet Jesus is exalted. To a Bible-thumping, well-informed Christian, this seems obvious, but not so much to the newly converted Hebrews. Remember, this was primarily written to Hebrews. So, verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. It's pretty much a direct quote from Psalm 2-7. Now in some versions, I have become your father is translated, um, I have begotten you from Psalm 2. So this is a translation of the Greek word monogamous, which means only one or alone. So it's similar to what we see in John 3.16, begotten son. This is mainly a quote also from uh, 2 Samuel 7.14, speaking of a future event when he says, I will become your father. He will be my son. So to clean things up a bit, Jesus was the Word through whom all things were made. But he was not yet fully the Son of God. Now this blows my mind. So this brings into the question of uh, doctrine of the something called the doctrine of eternal sonship. Now Hebrews one indicates there was a transformation into the sonship. We have to ask ourselves, was Jesus an angel prior to the incarnation? The answer is a, an emphatic no. Jesus was never an angel. Um, he was the Word. He was not created like an angel, but rather he was the creator part of God. We see in Job 1 and 2 uh, where it refers to angels as being sons of God, which can be a little confusing, because they were created by God. Adam is referred to as a, a son of God because he was created by God. Believers are referred to as sons of God. But according to Gary Hamrick, uh, the term used Ganeo, G-E-N-A-O-E, -E, uh, means to become equal to in substance or nature. So God would never say uh, this to an angel, um, Ganeo, where he was becoming equal to. And we notice as well that in uh, verse 5, that it is uh, the language that's being used is uh, begging the negative response. So very clearly, this is uh, it says to basically that to no angel did God ever say, "I will be His Father." The argument is very clear that Jesus was never an angel. Uh, our 
friends um, of a different faith, different religion, uh, claim that Jesus was the uh, um, archangel or that he was Michael. Uh, it didn't happen. It's clear in Scripture that he was not an angel. The angels serve Jesus. So verse 6, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Well, in Jewish terms, firstborn does not mean created genealogy. Rather, it means someone in the highest position of honor. Uh, so one who is preeminent in all circumstances. For instance, Isaac was not technically the firstborn in the family Ishmael was. Uh, but it was Isaac who was the firstborn for the chosen honor of being the, the blessed child. If we look at um, Matthew 4.10, Jesus said, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Yet, here in verse 6 of Hebrews 1, God instructs the angels to worship Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God. That's exactly why. Verse 7, in speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. Well, who is the he in this verse? Well, it's obviously Jesus. And the angels work for him, very specifically. Paul Abutelier says, uh, prior to the Incarnation, Jesus was the Word of God. After the Incarnation, when he became flesh, he became the Son of God, the Begotten. Remember that only term, that, uh, that term, that uh, mono monogamous term. So here's a quote from uh, Psalm 104, 1-4. Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beam of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. So, you know, Garasi says, uh, this is a picture of the Creator, and it is Jesus. The angels obey the Creator with the speed of the wind and the fervor of fire. So uh, the angels are servants of God and ergo servants of Jesus. Verse 8 but about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. <clears throat> so this is a quote from Psalm 45, 6-7. God calls Jesus God, then re references himself as your God. And so this is a really tight circle. John also calls Jesus God, so Peter also calls him God, and Paul also Paul calls Jesus God. Scripture never references Michael. Although a powerful and awesome and wonderful angel, he is never referenced as getting a promotion to Godhood, ever. Now remember, the angel Lucifer tried that very thing, and it did not work out well for him. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So who were or are Jesus' companions? That's the big question that I had as I jumped into this. Matthew Henry answers it pretty well. He states that God and the Holy Spirit are certainly his companions, but uh, the Trinity is not what the verse refers to. We be careful and realize that companions does not equate to equals. But rather, according to Gino Garasi, the Greek word for companions is metakos, uh, which means partners or associates. 
So, as an example, we are companions with our co-workers, but we are not equals. Each one has a rank and a function. Uh, Matthew Henry goes on to state uh, that Jesus is a companion to but above angels, prophets, priests, kings, saints, and Jewish brothers. David uh, Gusick says, uh, you in this, in this term, you have loved righteousness. So you refers to the Son. God refers to the Father. And the anointing is always richly associated with the Holy Spirit. So we see the Trinity, right there in that scripture. Verse 10. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same and your ears will never end. There's a strong reference to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus did all the creating, yet creation will perish when Jesus stops holding it all together. And it's going to be tossed out like old clothing. Yet the Creator... Jesus will remain. We finish up here with 13 and 14. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So this comes from uh, Psalm 110, uh, the seventh quote from the Old Testament prophecy about Jesus. David Gusek from Psalm 110, 13 says that no angels will sit at the right hand of God, nor do they ever rest, which is interesting. Angels are servants, ministering spirits. Let's talk for just a few minutes about angels specifically, because it can be a little confusing. So angels are, so angels are spirit beings that can take on human appearance. Hebrews 13.2 does indicate that we have entertained angels unaware. What exactly that means? Not sure, but certainly we have met them in flesh. So normally, second point about angels, normally they are invisible. They are made visible only by special revelation or times of special purpose. Number three, all angels seem to have been created at the same time, uh, sometime before the creation of the world. Number four, there seems to be an, a finite number of angels. Uh, in other words, they don't seem to procreate. Uh, now, there was an exception for a time before the flood. It seems that there were some angels that procreated with some human women and they created a, a race of individuals called Nephilim. That's a whole nother story. They're not around anymore. But they don't create, uh, they don't procreate together. And I'm sure they don't procreate anymore. Number five, we see that angels have, or at least had, a moral character. Number six, there are different classes of angels for specific duties. So there are cherubim, seraphim, living creatures, what they're called, and of course the archangel. Detail number seven, angels are called different names in scripture. Um, and there are eight, uh, nine sons of God, messenger, holy ones, ministering spirits, watchers, dominions, principalities, powers, and authorities are all different names referring to um, angels in Scripture. Number eight. 
They seem to be organized, and it's recognized that those who are now evil have geographical regions of dominion. Number nine, what do God's angels do? Well, first of all, they praise and glorify God. Second, they often have a role in bringing God's word to man. Third, they are agents of God's judgment. And number four, they observe the conduct of the church. And finally, number 10, there is one fallen angel, Lucifer, who took a third of the angels with him when he was kicked out. Now, Gino Garassi says that his angels are called demons, and his message to the world has been to seize the throne for yourself, and where God rules and reigns, you should rule and reign, and where God has authority, you should have authority. Now, those are what the demons will promote, those three items. Let's circle back a little bit on verse 14, which is, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So what's the point here? Jesus is above every angel, fallen or not. So there's no need to fear any demon. Now, don't go looking for trouble, but don't fear the demons. You are in the master's hand. You're in the, the hand of Christ. And finally, we see a quote from John Calvin that says, The angels are the dispensers and administrators of the divine beneficence toward us. They regard our safety, undertake our defense, direct our ways, exercise a constant solicitude that no evil befalls us. All right, so there in a nutshell is Hebrews 1. I trust you will be reading on Hebrews 2 and uh, press the follow.